Namaskar and welcome to In Focus. The United Front government has fallen, but to what extent was it responsible for its own collapse and what do senior members of the administration make of its performance in office? Here to discuss these two critical questions is one of the senior members of the government, the Home Minister and a former best parliamentarian, Indrajit Gupta. Next week, in part two of this interview, we shall talk to him about his own assessment of his time in office, his assessment of the performance of the Prime Minister, and his advice on how to handle future coalitions. But first, tonight, the Home Minister tells us about what he thinks went wrong, who is to blame, and how a possible relationship with the Congress Party can be put together again. Mr. Gupta, I want later in this interview to talk to you about your experiences in government, and in particular, running a coalition. But first, let's talk about the circumstances that brought about the fall of your government. Given that from the outset it was clear that the United Front depended upon the support of 140 Congress MPs, do you think your handling of the Congress party was proper and suitable? No, it could have been better. Expand it on that? It could have been better, no doubt. Because it's a coalition backed by a party, supporting party from outside, whose support is numerically uh, essential for your survival. So I'm, I agree with you, the handling of the relations between the two should have been uh, uh, much better. What are the sort of things that should have happened and didn't happen? Well, it's a question of setting up some kind of a, a proper machinery for regular consultation and uh, coordination and all that, which was not there. What you're saying in particular is that this feeling that the Congress party had that they were being neglected should have been taken care of. Yes, but they had never expressed it earlier, but we should have anticipated that. Are you also saying that, for instance, you should have had mechanisms in place so that you could consult them on policies, so that perhaps you could consult them on electoral strategies? Whatever is necessary for the two uh, to sort of act together. What was responsible? Cussedness? obstinacy, forgetfulness? Well, maybe uh, there was a sort of uh, idea at the back of our minds, or certainly my mind, that uh, politically speaking, the Congress had no alternative, no option open but to continue its support. Because where would it go? So you took them for granted? In that sense, yes. In fact, I have made that statement publicly and it has irritated them, no doubt. Statement that they have no choice but to support Yes, them. politically, politically, because their leader, Narasimha Rao, had stated as much on the floor of the house. You also said, if there is an election, then they will get the election. Yes, they will get the election. But now, now, looking back upon the fact, as you said, that you took them for granted, perhaps you also taunted them. Do you regret that? Yes, I regret. I have some bad habits, you know, which have got me into trouble more than once. One should be more polite and diplomatic in one's language, which I am not. And uh, sometimes I have to uh, retrace my, my uh, statements because of that. I don't wish to give offense to anybody. You're being very large-hearted. Are you actually saying that some of the blame for the mishandling of relations with the Congress is yours? No, I don't attach that much importance to myself. But somebody can say that this was one of the things which was a sort of Prick. For the record, whose responsibility should it have been within the United Front to ensure that relations with Congress were on an even keel, they were consulted, not well, neglected? Well, naturally the Prime Minister, primarily. He's the captain of the team. And uh, of course he has had no experience of a coalition government. That one must remember. Yes, but lack of experience isn't a sufficient explanation. No, no for that matter, most of us had no such experience either. I was reminded of uh, Mr. V.P. Singh's uh, Prime Ministership when he was being supported from outside by both the right and the left, the BGP on the one side and the left on the other. We were both supporting his government, without which he would not have had a majority. You bring up a great example because he held regular Friday evening consultations Tuesday, with people. Tuesday, Tuesday night. Tuesday, okay. Tuesday night, religiously. All of us used to meet together at his place and uh, whatever issues were pending or were matters which required clarification, we used to... Why did the United Front not emulate this example? It should have. 
should have. Who do you blame? Who do you pin the responsibility well, for? One can only blame oneself. No, but Why should said, I go about blaming others? No, but you said the initiative lay with the Prime Minister who's the captain of the team. He failed to take the initiative. Yes, he failed, but then none of us were at him for this. None of us were continually sort of badgering him about it either. If we no. had, he would probably have done something. Undoubtedly, and I accept your point that if you had badgered him, it would have been better. But nonetheless, taking the initiative was his job. He was the Prime Minister. And he I didn't said do it. that. I said that. So history is going to record that he allowed his government to get into this position because he wasn't able to take the initiative to keep a relationship going. If you think that this is the reason, the main reason or the sole reason why the Congress withdrew support. Well, let's come, let's, it? Let's come to another reason. <laughs> the Congress not just felt neglected, it also felt abused and said that the United Front enjoyed rubbing salt in its wounds. You now Self-inflicted wounds, I'm afraid. But did you rub salt? No, <laughs> never consciously. But self-inflicted wounds. Ah, but weren't you rubbing salt when you said they have no choice but to support us? Well, they seem to have taken umbrage at that. What can I do? You may not have intended to hurt their pride, but can you now accept that you did end up hurting their pride? No, I, I have said it in the house also that I do use harsh language sometimes, which uh, I should not. Not just you, because you're being very frank and open, and that's a very credible quality in you. Do you think the left as a whole, the CPI, the CPM, perhaps went a little bit too far out of their way to constantly criticize Congress, to constantly prick faults with them? No, 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 I don't think so, because those criticisms were almost entirely on policy issues. Yes, but remember that these are criticisms also of someone on whose support you depend. Do you think they may have been a little undiplomatic? I don't know about that, but these are not the issues which they raised ultimately. What Mr. Kesri uh, raised at the end before when he withdrew support was unfortunately not related to any issue of policy. He came and met you for an hour and a half, which no one knows too much about. You mentioned it briefly on the 11th in Parliament. I had to because what I wanted to point out that the media had failed. What? Well, now the media is inquiring. Yeah. What did he say to you on that day? He said that uh, this man, the Prime Minister, is uh, uh, treating us as an enemy. He wants to destroy my party, you see, and therefore I could not uh, sit uh, quietly and tolerate it. And Ever since I became the president of the Congress, he seems to think that I'm a sort of uh, potential enemy or rival of his, which I'm not. And uh, I said, that's very well, but then what was the immediate provocation for withdrawing support? To which, of course, he gives no clear reply. I said, is it something to do with these uh, people are writing and talking about some investigations into some cases? He said, I don't know, I don't did you accept that dismissive? I don't accept way? anything he says. But do you concede the point that perhaps at times, to his eyes, the government looked as if they were gunning for Congress? To his eyes? Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't seem to be the reaction of most of the congressmen. Let me put something to you, not said by Mr. Kesri, but said by thinking reflective MPs in his party. They say, the day Surendra Mahatho turned approver, the prosecution was involved in the preparation of his evidence to court. And if at that stage a new name comes up, that of the Congress President, Sita Ram Kesri, it's going to look suspicious in Congress eyes. His name was there already. But it hadn't come up previously. It was included only after Mahatho turned approver. And as you know, when a man turns approver, his evidence is then prepared by the prosecution, probably by the CBI. But it's under the law, it's permissible evidence. It's admissible evidence. Because it's an approval's evidence, it, veracity is not uh, questioned. Except that if there's the prosecution's hand in the preparation, won't it look suspicious to your great supporter that suddenly the tables are being turned on him? No, in this particular case, I don't think so, because the role of the Congress uh, leadership, as far as the JMM case was concerned, was established law much earlier. Only then it was Narasimha Rao. Do you not think that given that his name had come up, as you say, in an admissible way, and given that you didn't want to stand in the way of legal procedures, 
Nonetheless, the government should have quietly got in touch with him and said, Mr. Kesri, this is what's happened. We want you to know in advance. He found out from the papers. I don't know about this. But prima facie, again, isn't this an area where it could have been handled better? But I don't think this was a major issue. And he denied it very stoutly to me. Why did he deny it? He should have said that uh, he was trying to frame me or something, but he never said anything like that. Let me come back to the central core of what I'm trying to get at, I suppose. Do you think, reflecting on the 10 months that you spent in office, that one of the dilemmas that the United Front was caught between was that on the one hand, it was critically dependent upon Congress support for survival. On the other hand, many elements of the United Front couldn't break free of the anti-Congressism that's been a part of their lives for so long. And you were caught on these two pegs. Well, the first part of your question is correct. The second part is partly correct because the inhibitions of some of the partners of the front was not due to anti-Congressism. It was due to the fact that the policy positions on which they had stood all these years when they were uh, opposition parties, those uh, policy perceptions were uh, not being uh, followed or adhered to now. So they were uncomfortable, naturally. Nothing strange about that. So it's the difference of policy perception, not what I call anti-Congressism? No, it would have been any other party we had been involved, it would have been the same. It's a little depressing what you're saying is no matter who the party would have been, you'd have taken them equally for granted. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that their, their policies and programs would not perhaps have suited our uh, perceptions and therefore we would have on occasion we would have criticized them. Okay, let me try the tack a different way. Let's forget that we're talking about the Congress Party in the US. Let's just talk about parliamentary democracy. In a parliament, if a government is dependent upon 140 odd MPs for support, don't they have a choice in determining who the Prime Minister should be? How can they? They're outside the government. But the government depends upon their support for its survival. But they, then you have to uh, initiate some new parliamentary traditions and conventions. Mr. Gupta, the parliamentary tradition is that the Prime Minister survives upon a majority in the House. If that majority includes 140, the 140 have a say in choosing who the PM should be? They can have a say. I mean, they can express an opinion. But the, but the party which is actually running the government is not obliged to take the, accept their opinion. No, but they, should look, they should listen to their opinion and give it due consideration, no doubt. Would but they never did that either. They never came up with any You suggestion. see, what the Congress was actually saying was not change the UF leadership. They were saying change the Prime Minister. You equated, that is now, now. You equated the two. That is now at the fag end. Never all these 10 months. But when they changed their position at the fag end, they were saying not change the UF leadership. What they were saying is change the PM. No, no. You equated the two and made a problem. They were also equating both. What is the difference? They were equating both. The leader of the United Front was naturally the head of the government also. Well, then tell me this. Right up till the 11th night, the United Front, on principle, refused to change its leader. 48 hours later, the leader is prepared to go. Yes. What's happened? What's changed? Why couldn't no, we... No, that's the meaning of parliamentary democracy. It doesn't happen under other systems. This is something which should give you some encouragement that such a thing can take place. There can be such flexibility and such uh, capacity to uh, react to developing situations. Well, it have been, the country would have been spared the pain, what the pain? expense, and the hangama and tamasha, oh, if you'd agreed two days earlier uh, to change the prime minister. Uh, maybe now, be, uh, I'm not sure, but it uh, looks as though you will certainly be spared the expense and the pain of another election, which is a big achievement in itself. Are you also saying that the prime minister could not have changed without the spectacle of the no confidence vote? There was no no confidence motion. A vote of confidence. Uh, Without that, the Prime Minister couldn't have changed. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't so think that. So that was an essential step. You had to go to the brink to retreat. No, I don't think so at all. Whatever change has come about is entirely due to uh, compulsions within the front. Not what? What, not what happened on the floor. Explain those compulsions to me. What are they? Why is the front suddenly now, changing? Mean the majority of the constituents at the front, if they feel that it would be wiser 
for the for uh, the prime minister to step down and a new leader to be elected well he has to take due note of such compulsions yes but why did they not think this before the 11th why are they thinking it after the 11th what's changed because before the 11th they were facing a a direct challenge from not only the congress but also the bjp and after the 11th they worried about elections after the 11th we found that uh, no mp of any party cutting across party lines was prepared for an election aap ye keh rahe ke pehle congress ko harana tha aur ab mulk se apne aap ko bachana hai aap kuch bhi sochiye but that's true isn't it it's fear of an election yeah. that's got the united front to change the position but fear of an election is there in all the parties because personally i feel as i spoke there also that the voter would not only be unhappy about another election he would be angry also he'd hang you with your word. with all the parties that why should you go on repeatedly putting us into this uh, jam in which case not so much as home minister but as one of the country's greatest parliamentarians why aren't you people subjecting yourself to the wrath of the voter it's a justified wrath as you keep saying because of precisely what you are saying that it will cost the country so much again there this is a big country with so many people we have not passed the budget yet all this would have gone into the melting pot but then mr gupta i come back to my point if the financial stability of the country the budget the cost of elections was so important you could have agreed to change prime minister before the 11th and we wouldn't have had to waste any time on the 11th we could have just got on with normal functioning you could have agreed to do this 10 days earlier no no i think the debate on the 11th was very very necessary in order to to give the people of the country a, a understanding of what had happened and there is nobody who is prepared to give a single word of explanation as to why this uh, support was suddenly withdrawn i challenge them repeatedly not one leader got up to speak is this something which which you, know, you talk about accountability this is this is the way a a, a, see a leading party which has ruled the country for 50 years this is the way their leaders behave and should the people of the country not know and hear about it so the 11th was important to expose the congress yes party. yes that was one of the definitely one of the one of the main uh, purposes of it and i think it has served that purpose but didn't you in the process also at least partly get exposed yourself mr vajpay made the telling point ki aapne bhi unke sath baat cheet nahi ki consultation nahi kiya points which are accepted today consultation ke bare zarur maine kaha consultation nahi kiya ye hamari ek galti thi kamzori thi लेकिन ये जो इन्होंने किया रेकिंग द होल गवर्नमेंट एंड ब्रिंगिंग अबाउट इंस्टेबिलिटी इन द होल पॉलिटिकल सिस्टम इज इट द सेम थिंग कैन यू पुट द टू ऑन अ पार व्हाट यू आर सेइंग इज वी मे हैव सिन्ड बट वी डिडंट डिजर्व टू बी किल्ड फॉर द सिन वी आर नॉट बीइंग किल्ड वी नीड नॉट बॉदर वी विल सी हु विल बी किल्ड ओके योर 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 साउंडिंग इज इफ यू बिलीव देयर इज रेजरेक्शन अहेड लेट्स एक्सेप्ट दैट दैट्स इट फॉर पार्ट 1 बट डोंट गो अवे वी विल बी बैक विद पार्ट 2 इन जस्ट अ कपल ऑफ मोमेंट्स Welcome back to part 2 of our interview with Home Minister Indrajit Gupta. Let's talk about the future. If another united front government were to be created with a new prime minister but once again dependent upon Congress support, from your experience, what advice would you now give them about handling this critical relationship with the Congress? Well, we have already taken some decisions which have been communicated to the Congress that a, a institutionalized uh machinery will be set up we are prepared to do it immediately what you call the coordination committee uh, you can call it by any name you like but whose purpose would be to see that regular and frequent consultations and coordination between the two take place and this is this was what vp singh was doing he had a much tougher job when he was handling both the left and the right together but he did it and will this be under congress leadership this committee no the, the committee this coordination committee are talking about no no what do you mean by leadership you mean well, who would there be a chairman of it well we haven't worked out all that just now but could it be a congressman uh we could have a rotational system alternately or something that can be adjusted that that's the first lesson what are the other lessons that you would suggest to a future uf government dependent upon congress support well i think that the uh, since this front was a front uh, consisting of so many parties 13 or 14 parties and 9 or 10 chief ministers it's not a joke 
Mr. Thapar, you can't create a coalition so easily like that in this country. That's why I attach the greatest importance to it from a historical point of view. But sometimes in such a case where there are so many parties with different backgrounds, different uh, experiences, different histories behind them, there are bound to be differences among them also, among themselves. And that calls for a much more uh, skillful handling of the, of the perceptions of the different partners. That they must be consulted more frequently, more thoroughly. This was also sometimes perhaps not done, which is why, which is why, as you were saying a little earlier, some of the parties sometimes were openly criticizing the government. Which means once again the onus comes upon the Prime Minister, because he is the one who has to do the consulting. Yes, true, he should. He should have, but uh, take the case of my party, which was in the position of both being in the government as well be, as being a supporting party from outside. We were supporting the front. We were also members of the government. As members of the government or the cabinet, of course, you have limited options. You can't uh, publicly state uh, differences which may be there within the cabinet. You can't publicly state what stand you have taken, your ministers have taken on a particular issue. More or less, the cabinet's decisions are taken as being unanimous. But from outside, you can carp and criticize as much as you want. We did it. We were doing it. The other left parties were doing it, but they were not members of the government. Yes, but this is a very peculiar justification very you peculiar. created. We're part of the government, yes. but we're not part yes. of the government. Yes, very peculiar. This is a new historical experience we are going through. And I had raised it many times in discussions that uh, you tell us what to do because uh, this is a position which is difficult for us also. You said this to your party? No, no, I've said it to the party. I said it to the parties also. But no answer was forthcoming no, to no, anyone. No answer was forthcoming because everybody is going through the same experience and uh, was not very clear as to how to handle such a situation. I want to explore this a little bit more in part two of our interview, but come back to what I want to finish this part of the interview with. The whole thing now depends upon the person who becomes the new Prime Minister. He has this difficult task of handling Congress. He has a difficult task of handling 13 members of the United Front. True. You have to be very careful choosing Mr. Gauda's replacement, don't you? True. You have to try and find a better man who has... True. You accept that? Actually, you have to try to find somebody who... No, can... no, a better man is what you accepted. What do you mean by better man? A man who is better able to handle these difficult relationships. You can't be sure about that till he's been tested. But what you also said is that Mr. Gata could have handled them better. He wasn't quite up to the task. Because I don't think he had uh, the requisite experience. Did he have the talent and the skill? Talent is... Uh, why not? Talent is not something which is very... Uh, based on uh, great... Uh, Scholarliness or but if he had the talent, it wasn't realized, it wasn't seen in a big way. Well, I don't know. Uh, somebody was telling me this morning, a congressman, that I must say, you people kept together, you stuck together for 10 months. There was no crack. There was no split. You have so many splits within but, but, single but, but as you're saying, the new man has to do more than just keep together. He has to actually bind you together. You should try to do that, certainly. Mr. on that note, I'm going to end this part of the interview. In part two, I want to talk to you about your own experiences in government, your own reflections upon what the United Front Ministry achieved, and this important subject that you raised at the end, how better can these 13 parties learn to cooperate amongst themselves so that they bind together? But for that, we'll have to be next week. For now, it's goodbye from the home of Mr. Indrajit Gupta to next week when we return with part two of this interview.